Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dearly loved disciples of Jesus gathered to continue growing as one of his disciples. A few weeks ago, the prophet Isaiah reminded us that when God's servant son, our Savior, would come to us, he would not come in violence. He would not come shouting and screaming at people. Rather, he would be gentle. He, he, he would not give up with messed up people. Rather, a broken reed and a, excuse me, a, a, and, a, and a smoldering wick, he would not break off or, or snuff out. And this was because God had sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. At his first coming then, Jesus came to proclaim God's grace to sinners. Grace that had sent him to be the savior of those sinners. With that in mind, we're going to consider Jesus' opening words in his Sermon on the Mount. A sermon he preached on a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And as he speaks these opening words to you, I want you to, to picture Jesus looking right into your eyes as he speaks these words. And here's what he said. The Bible tells us, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And I'm going to make a few points here. I want you to note that in the first blessing here in chapter 3, in or verse 3, in the 1 and 10, he uses a present tense. In the intervening verses, he uses a future tense. But I also want you to note that when he says those, he's really meaning you, because he clarifies that at the end. He comes back and says you. So he's been talking to these disciples this whole time when he speaks these words. So now listen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How did you hear those words? Or better yet, the better question is, how do you think Jesus intended for you to hear those words? Do you suppose it was a gentle way to call you to repentance? Or do you suppose that he was giving you a gentle condemnation for not being like everything he described here? Or was it simply your Savior pronouncing blessings on you as his disciple, as his child? Theologians over the years have not always agreed on how Jesus intended those or how we should receive those words. But that's not really our debate this morning. My question is this. How do you receive them? I want you to think about that as we now study these opening words in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' kind and gentle approach to those disciples sitting on the hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, I believe, is very notable. It certainly assures us that he is the one Isaiah prophesied. But when I take these, persons, these words to heart, I so often... After I've caught myself 
in a sin that I've been waging war against for so, so long, but alas, have yet again given into. My conscience is pricked. And I begin to think some very dark thoughts. I begin to think, wow, what a failure I am. I, I, I've been a failure to myself, to my God, and, and to others around me. And I, I, I imagine I must frustrate God. I must, he, I, I must in, incur his anger. And certainly the frustration and the anger of others around me. And, and God should be done with me. I should fully expect for this nth time I've committed this sin that God is, is going to find a way to shame me publicly. Make me bear the, the shame of that sin. Expose me, as it were. And maybe God should work to depose me as one of his shepherds and probably ought to divorce me as one of his children and leave me as an orphan again. And why do I think that? Because that's very well how I might treat someone who had sinned against me to the number and the degree that I've sinned against God. And so I begin, then begin to think, well, then maybe my failure to be able to conquer this sin and live a righteous life is, is because I, I'm not really what I think or believe myself to be. I say I'm a Christian, but am I really? Am I just fooling myself? Am I deceiving myself with such thoughts? And if so, well, then game's up. I might as well spend what little time I have light, left, right, throw caution to the wind and try to suck some joy out of life before the flames of hell are stoked to receive me. Have you ever had such thoughts and feelings? If you have, then you know the heat and the strain of spiritual warfare. The devil becomes a great ally with our consciences. Now, I, I want to assure you that having a conscience that bothers you once in a while is not a bad thing. God gave that to you for a reason. But when the devil chimes in with your conscience, he teams up to do a very demonic thing with you. And so the devil has some progression to his temptations. There's some method behind the madness. And I want to share those with you so you understand the devil will first come to you and try to tempt you to believe, try to convince you, often with misused and misquoted Bible passages, that God is against you. He doesn't love you. He has it in for you. He's not all that devoted to you. He's holding out on you. And if he can get you to walk down that mental path with him, he's got to, he's got, he uses the next one. Again, misusing, misquoting passages, he will assure you it's okay to sin. And God will forgive you anyway, right? And so when you see that the sin is good and pleasing to the eye, you decide you will commit that sin. And that's when the devil turns on a dime and you see his ugliest side. He jumps right on the side of your conscience and he accuses and condemns you. That's what his name means. Satan means the accuser. That's what he does. And so... He says, oh, now you've done it. That's the nth number of time you have committed that sin. God is done with you. He's finished with you. There is no hope for you. You have crossed the line from which there is no coming back. And then he will use and misquote scripture to assure you that that is what God will do to you. He's not finished. What will he do then? Well, then he's going to tempt you in, in a line of thinking that says, well, if I can't, if, if I'm done for, well, then all I can do is commit a whole bunch of self-destructive sins, addictions, whatever you want to call them, self-destructive sins, to salve my conscience. You know, enjoy whatever life I have left before it's all over. You recognize that pattern of temptation? You ever seen that play out either in your life or the life of someone you love or know? Well, but wait, there's more. Devil's not finished yet. He then convinces you again with misused and misquoted Bible passages that if you ever should meet Jesus or one of his messengers, right, they are going to come and condemn you. He's not your savior anymore. He's your righteous judge. And so you can fully expect God's anger and condemnation. Again, sound familiar? 
you, you recognize that progression in the devil's temptations? Please understand, Jesus could not be more opposite than the way the devil has portrayed him. And, and this is why God has seen to it that his name and reputation throughout history, Jesus' life and ministry and his saving work, as well as God's will and his promises and his commentary on all of it, has been recorded for us permanently, written in indelible ink in the Bible. So, for you who have come carrying a burden of guilt and sin, to you who have felt the sting of shame and guilt, to you who come bearing the scars of spiritual warfare that you've been engaged in for the past week, you come to this Jesus and the first words out of his mouth to you are what? Blessed are you. So opposite of what the devil was setting you up for, isn't it? Blessed are you. Those precious words are the words of the one God sent to save you and not to condemn you. Now when I read these beatitudes, we call them, the word really means blessings. It's from the Latin word beato or beatific, you may have heard that word. It's blessings, okay? So when I read these blessings, what were you thinking? Oh, that's me all day long. What were you thinking? Well, I'm a, I'm a little more like that. I'm not so much of this, and this one needs a little more work. Or were you like, I wish any of it could be true of me. Well, here's the mind-blowing truth. All nine of those verses, all nine of those blessings, and the encouragement to rejoice are, in fact, yours. Because you are disciples of Jesus. Yours, because they are true of people that God has adopted into his family through baptism and faith. Now, I, I want to point out the formula that Jesus uses here. Notice it's not conditional. Jesus does not say, Blessed are those, or blessed are you, if you do these things. It's not a conditional structure. Also what's not there is, blessed are those, blessed are you, because you do these things. Rather, the formula is this. Blessed are you who are and do these things, and then comes the because. Because this is what God does for you. So the blessing has nothing to do with you, really, at all. The blessing has to come from God, who gives it to you, and who, quite frankly, made you the person that he describes, the one who is and does those, those things. So that means you are already, as you have frequently confessed, and as Jesus already knows, you're the poor in spirit, the spiritually poor. Haven't you confessed that frequently? When you come to worship and we begin with a confession and absolution, you're coming and confessing what? I am spiritually poor. I have nothing. I can't bring anything that isn't covered with sin. I can't bring anything that God will find pleasing. I can't bring an offering that will appease him. In fact, just coming to him, I'm already a problem because everything I have and am, he's already given to me. I got nothing. That's who you are. Going on, well, who else are you? You are those who mourn, aren't you? Do you not mourn and grieve over your sins? Do you not mourn the condition, the consequences of those sins, both in your life and in the lives and the, the world around us? Do, are you not meek and humble and gentle? Yes, the world despises it of you. Are, aren't you a one who, who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, who de deeply desires to do the good that God has called you to do? And because God has shown mercy to you, aren't you at least struggling to try to show that same kind of mercy and compassion to others? Aren't you then pure in heart? Aren't, aren't you also, because you enjoy peace with God, a peacemaker who wants to work that peace out in your other relationships? And, and, and certainly you are among those who are 
persecuted because of your relationship with Jesus. Yet, the one sent into the world to save you and not to condemn you says this. He pronounces blessings on you. He says you will be, you, you are really, you, you do already have the kingdom of God. You, you have that already. He goes on to say you, you will be comforted. You will inherit the earth. What does that mean? means you will receive the daily bread, the necessities. In other words, you don't lose out from being meek and humble and gentle. God makes sure that you have the daily necessities of life. You who hunger and thirst for rightness, you will be filled with righteousness. He said, you will be shown mercy. You will continue to be shown mercy. You will see God. You will be called the children of God. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. You are blessed because you are persecuted, because there you've joined the company of the prophets who preceded you. For all your guilt and sin, for all my guilt and sin, and it is very great, Jesus comes to us with blessings and not curses. Blessings to change and transform our hearts and minds and not the curses that we well deserve. That's not because God looked the other way. It's not because God's ignoring sin or it doesn't matter anymore to him. And it certainly is not because God is unjust and has cooked the books. Again, the reason that God pronounces blessings on people, on his people, is because of Jesus the very one who was speaking these words to these people on the, sea, on the seaside of, of Galilee. He, he not only brought us messages of blessing from God, but here's the thing to note. He bought them. Not only did he bring them, he bought them. Jesus didn't come and just uh, nullify, recant God's curses against sinners. And what Jesus did is he, come, he came and he took your sin from you. And then he applied the curses that those sins deserve to himself. And then he's the one who went to suffer at the hands of God. He's the one who suffered those curses, the punishment of sin for you. And brothers and sisters, that is what we call grace in action. It is... It is incredible then, the love that God shows to us in Jesus, his son. If, if he would not draw the line of his love at his own dear son, then there is no line. There is no line beyond which he is not willing to go to continue to show that love to you. So consider again his blessings to you. Your spiritual poverty, he's already replaced with the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Your mourning and sorrowing, he has already comforted. Your spiritual meekness, he has already blessed by giving you your daily necessities. Your, the, the righteous life, the, the, the good and godly good works that you want to do for God are never a vain pursuit. Rather, they flow from the perfect righteousness that is already yours in Christ Jesus. He lived it for you, and then he credited it to you through faith in him. And so what good you do has already been washed in the blood of Jesus, has already been covered in his righteousness, and God allows to stand as your good work. Now think about that. And it's true with all these blessings. God's doing all the work, and you're getting the blessings and the credit for it. Wow. He continues, the mercy and the compassion that you show to others is going to 
it, it, God is going to continue to show you his mercy and compassion already in the blood of the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Your deep longing to go to heaven where you can see God and live, and, and, and that's already been gifted to you in the one who is the resurrection and the life. Your, your efforts at preserving peace not only in your relationship with God, a peace that He first established with you, but, but preserving that peace in your other human relationships, you will be blessed by the God who blesses you with every assurance that you are His child through Him who is the Son of God. Finally, your hope to be rescued from the pain and the fire of persecution in whatever forms you may suffer it, is a reality in Him who has already made you co-rulers with Him in His kingdom, where He has stored for you not just eternal life, but the treasures, eternal treasures also. These blessings and these promises of God are yours, brought to you by the blood and righteousness of Jesus your Savior and such grace and mercy that he has lavished on you will fortify you today and tomorrow in your battles against temptation and sin and guilt and they will strengthen you to say no to Satan and temptation but yes to the good works that God has already prepared for you to do but if you do fail and you do fall. These blessings don't go away. They remain, and they are there to assure you that when you repent, God will show that mercy to you every time. And then they will continue to strengthen you. And they will help you shut out that accusing voice of the devil and the conscience who would tell you that God does not love you anymore. And after all of this, you will be able to rejoice. To rejoice in the overwhelming victory that Jesus has already won for you. Friends, in this season of growing, the way we grow in God's blessings is by growing in faith through God's word and sacraments, through faith in Christ Jesus. And so when you heard these blessings, I pray you saw Jesus. So how did you hear these blessings? How would you hear them now? I pray you would, you would respond this way. Oh yeah, that's me all day long, only because of my beautiful Savior. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank, thank you that you came and did just as your word had said you would. In all gentleness and, and humbleness, we thank you that you came not to condemn us, but to pronounce God's blessings on us, who are yours through faith in you. We ask that you would continue to strengthen our faith as we grow in your word, as we receive your sacraments. We ask that you would strengthen that faith, forgive our, our sins, then also strengthen us to exercise that faith. Put that faith into practice by doing the good works that you have prepared for us to do. And in this way, we seek to give glory to you. Lord Jesus, bless this to your glory. Amen. Mm -hmm.